San Diego Bay is one of this country's most outstanding natural harbors, a major reason this city took root and flourished here. I'm Ken Kramer. Today, rather than view this panorama from afar, we'll go behind the scenes and take a close-up look at the waterfront and its people. We will meet Paul Torres, a second-generation longshoreman who has seen wrenching physical labor give way to pushing buttons. We're probably still tough guys, but we don't have to be strong, tough guys anymore. We will accompany a harbor pilot, Captain Lloyd Malin, as he tackles the tension-filled task of guiding a 21,000-ton ship safely to its mooring. We will climb aboard a modern tuna saner to meet Roland Verissimo, patriarch of one of San Diego's tuna fishing dynasties, who will give us a rare inside look at the early days of pole fishing and at the life-threatening risks of modern pursing. For these three people, as for so many others, the port is more than pleasant background scenery. It is a vital focus of their lives. Among the most prominent features of the harbor are the tuna boats. Close to 120 of them are based in San Diego, all but about 10 of the entire United States fleet. Over the years, tuna fishing has changed dramatically, but the people involved have not changed much. Most still come from San Diego's Italian and Portuguese-American families who have dominated tuna fishing for decades. Almost all of the families gathered here in Point Loma trace their roots to the Madeira Islands. Every Christmas for more than 50 years, they have formed choruses to sing religious carols in Portuguese. They form part of San Diego's Portuguese-American community, a close-knit world where more than half the men fish for tuna. The religious pageant is over. Fishermen burst into rollicking songs in Portuguese. But this year, many are missing. They have remained at sea because large-scale modern fishing now dictates longer trips and longer separations from their families. Theirs is a tradition of independence and separation, one that has passed from generation to generation and bonded family to family. Tuna Captain Roland Verissimo looks on with his wife and grandchildren. All five of his sons are tuna fishermen, but four of them could not make it home to celebrate. Roland remembers when trips were shorter before tuna fishing became the high volume, big business it is today. The first time I went fishing, I was probably about 10 years old. And the first one that took me fishing was my father. Well, I loved it. I've always loved the ocean. In the mid-1930s, Rolland fished with his father on a boat much like this one. I couldn't wait for summer to go fishing. I left school when I was about 15 years old. I left Point Loma High School to go tuna fishing. The big boats in them days were about 130, 40 ton of fish. That's all they would carry. They were all small wooden boats. When we went after big fish, from 100 pounds to maybe 200 pounds, we would have three men on three different poles coming down to one hook. And we would land, three men would have to land one fish. We would make a trip on them little boats. It would, we usually make it in 20, 30 days. After we uh, finished up our trips out there, we would come in and, and land our fish at a cannery in San Diego. It was about 1960 when one innovation revolutionized tuna fishing. It was called purse seining, the encircling of entire schools of tuna by an enormous curtain of a net, then cutting off escape by pulling on the bottom drawstring to form a pouch or purse. In one set, fishermen now could scoop up a catch that would have taken a month of pole fishing. San Diego tuna men quickly plunged into the new world of sophisticated technology and high finance. To buy an outfit a tuna boat today would cost anywhere from nine to ten million dollars. We carry around 230,000 gallons of fuel. You figure it's a dollar a gallon. And then our grocery bill runs from about uh, 20 to 30,000. 
I'd say the day we leave port, we're in the hole about uh, $300,000. Show me your golf course. Roland Verissimo has given up active fishing to oversee his family's tuna ventures as managing owner. He has just added tuna boat number five to his family's holdings. I bought this boat for my younger son, Philip. He's my younger boy. Now I'll have all five of them. They'll all be captains now. I've only had one son that finished school. That was my oldest son. All the rest were just like I was. They couldn't finish high school. They loved fishing so much they had to leave school. Tomorrow, Rollins' 23-year-old son will set out in his first boat across almost 4,000 miles of open ocean to stock the schools of tuna he hopes to find near Samoa. Today is a trial run, not to catch fish, but to check out electronic instruments, to set the mile-long net, to test the teamwork of the crew and the pilot of the new helicopter. Tell your pilot uh, to get the bird ready so we can try him before we make a set. Because after you make a set, you're going to be laying two, and it's going to be hard for him to land when you're, when you're uh, stopped. You'll be rolling pretty hard. I want to pout and practice a couple times before I get in. That's right, Joe. Joe? Helicopters have increased the tuna boat's range, but they have also increased the risk. Last year, one of Rollins' sons was in his helicopter, searching for signs of tuna in the vastness of the Western Pacific. And uh, another helicopter had crashed, and uh, my son just he jumped out of a chopper to save a boy that was drowning. I think the kind of fishing we do today is a lot more dangerous than pole fishing. Because of breaking cable, you break a piece of cable like that going through a winch, you could actually cut a man right in half. The rehearsal was cruising along without a hitch when the end of the cable jammed and snapped. The 50-ton net threatened to plunge to the ocean floor. Crewmen leapt into the chill water to grapple with the weight of the floundering web that could drag them down. Once you haven't got that hooked up to your, to your boat, that whole net can sink and you can actually lose that net. That today, that cost over $300,000. The crewmen eventually would triumph in their tug of war against the sea. The net would be saved. It was one more risk in this high-rolling gamble, where winning depends on expert management and on a captain who knows how to find the elusive schools of tuna. There's very few good skippers today that really know what they're doing. I'd say about 70% go broke in the tuna business. My boys do very, very well. Ever since they were little kids and came out summertime with me, I used to make them come up to mass with me. They'd spend all day with me. They know what I know, plus what they know, so they will be better than I was. My grandsons go fishing in the summertime now with their fathers. They're doing the same thing. But bringing home the fish no longer guarantees a profit in today's world of foreign competition, sluggish demand, and high costs. One of my sons last year caught around 4,000 ton, about $4 million worth of tuna. And he just barely broke even last year. That's how bad the interest rates hurt the tuna boats. A few boats went bankrupt. Many are for sale, but almost no one is buying. Some observers have predicted disaster for the San Diego tuna fleet, but Roland has a different perspective. I've gone through this before, where too many outside people like lawyers and doctors, and they've all come into the tuna boat business, and then they've all gone broke, and then things will get real good for the fishermen again. Roland Verissimo and others like him still are banking on the family tradition that has been their heritage. You have to be born into it. From the outside, it, it's real hard. 